Davis, Dr. Sneakus, and His Excellency Andrea Meloni, Ambassador of Italy to Canada. My name is Claude Faubert, Vice President of Collection and Research here at the Museum, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to a wonderful evening titled The Periodic Table Revisited Chemistry and Life. This event is part of the museum's year-long celebration of the International Year of Chemistry. This evening, the evening is being uh, webcast live thanks to the Contemporary Studies Program at the University of King's College in Halifax and the Situation Science Strategic Knowledge Cluster. And this is the museum's first live webcast, so it's a new thing for us. Une petite note, les présentations ce soir sont en anglais, mais il nous fera grand plaisir de répondre à vos questions lors de la période de questions. Please keep the ticket that you were given at the entrance, as there will be a draw at the end of the evening. Our guide for the evening is Jack Horowitz. Jack worked for many years in Ottawa for the National Film Board, as well as for the United Way of Canada. Jack is currently, among many other things, chair of the board of the Canadian Film Institute. Now I'd like to call upon Jack to be our uh, entertaining guest for this evening. Not guest, sorry, but host. <laughs> Bonsoir tout le monde, thank you, Your Excellency, guests, people online, welcome. I hope it's going to be a, a stimulating evening and something of a challenge. Um, the evening is really dedicated to the intersection between science and art. And I really would appreciate your help to investigate the place where this meets, where science and the arts take place, takes its place in our lives. We're using the book, The Periodic Table, as a structure, as a as sort of a theme, a backdrop to the entire evening. And in many ways, it's given us our inspiration, and it leads us to explore topics that normally would not be a topic used in a scientific lecture. So this isn't a lecture in the traditional sense. It's a hybrid, very similar to his writing, somewhat like a reflection in a mirror. We're going to start the program tonight with an overview of his life. I'm going to call on Dr. David Pantaloni to present you the next course, so to speak, um, which will be a, a look at the, uh, an investigation, a, a, a relation, uh, not yet though, David. <laughs> Don't get so eager. <laughs> I have a lot to say. <laughs> um, he'll, he'll talk about the periodic table, its importance. That will tie into the next part, which is actually listening to Levy in his own words. And we have three people from Ottawa who actually have interesting perspectives and can lead us through. You will hear the words of Levy in brief excerpts, so you get a feel for what this man wrote. And then Dr. Victor Sneakus, uh, a renowned uh, uh, chemist and researcher, uh, and a great inspiration to his students. Um, we'll follow with a, just a small armchair interview uh, between myself and Victor Sneakus, and then we will get your questions and have a, the draw afterwards, and then a little break with some coffee and tea. First, let me admit that I'm no expert on Primo Levi. And for that matter, I'm no expert on science. But I do feel deeply that science profoundly affects our lives. And I'm convinced that we all have to pay a much greater attention to the effects that science has on our society and also how society affects and relates to our science. This evening is going to be filled with stories so allow you to tell me, to allow me to set the stage by telling you one of my own. When I was 13 years old, I got a, a gift. It was a small metal box. And in that box, I believe it was Fisher Scientific, in that box was a small chemistry lab. Bunsen burner, test tubes, a little book. I was enthralled. I knew nothing about chemistry. But I set up a lab in my parents' basement and I started into it, and at first, of course, the first thing I was interested in was the magic of chemistry. 
For me, it was just extraordinary to understand what chemical reactions did. I watched them, and then I started to, as a, as a boy, I was interested in rockets, and obviously Roman candles and explosions, and even hydrogen balloons. Well, in my little lab in the basement, I started to try to fill some balloons with hydrogen but I couldn't get the pressure high enough. I actually wanted to take an aerial photograph of my neighborhood. Uh, but unfortunately, the uh, hydrogen escaped into the air and the Bunsen burner in the corner connected with the hydrogen and I had a flash explosion. It quickly died down uh, and immediately I opened the windows uh, to the basement and of course at that moment my parents arrived back in the car. It was the end of a brilliant career. <laughs> uh, instead, I studied art. I thought it was going to be a little safer. So we're going to use Primo Levi's book, The Periodic Table, tonight as the basis of the event. It allows us to move from the world of science, from its codes of law, its trade, its failures and successes, to the telling and the recounting of stories, the recording of events, and what we take from this as our own principles, as our own sense of wisdom. Levy's stories are filled with eloquence. There's a richness. It feels like we're in an intimate conversation with a really extraordinary person. It also tends to evoke memories of our own and gives value to those. He tells these stories because he has to. He presents us with a life as lived and then distills it for us, drawing from it an essence. And all of his writing is colored or is at least an attempt to understand his own life experience and especially that from Auschwitz. So the question really, is science intrinsic to the human experience? Do we seek facts from our lives in order to test and prove ourselves? Can we make sense out of the observable? What role is belief in all this? I think these are questions that Levy poses to us. Levy was born in Turin in 1919. In a cultivated middle class, fairly assimilated Jewish family, he was trained as a chemist and in 1941 received a doctorate. But due to the growing anti-Semitism in Italy against the oldest Jewish community in Europe, he was forced to take odd jobs, first in a varnish factory, then in a nickel mine. He was arrested as a member of an anti-fascist resistance and deported to Auschwitz in 1941, 1944. Of the 650 people, deported on that same train. Levy was among the 20 who survived. As a scientist in Auschwitz, he was useful to the Nazis. But more importantly, his work as a writer, for his, but more importantly, for his work as a writer, were his encounters with other inmates, especially one who helped him, a stranger who helped him survive. He bore witness to these events. He tried to attract, extract some truth, some gold from that horrendous experience. And it became the subject of his first book in 1947, Sequesto e un uomo, If This is a Man. It came at a time of trauma, of silence from Holocaust survivors, who asked themselves, why did I survive? How can I bear this memory? How was this allowed to happen? And on the other side, the societies of Europe, there was denial that it even took place, that no one could have really affected the outcome, that we were all victims, said so many, as they excused themselves. This book is Levy's attempt to break the silence, to bear witness, to understand, and it was not until almost a decade later that the book achieved some notice and then another 20 years followed before it received wide acclaim. During this time, Levy worked as a manager in a chemical facility and finally in 1977 with the publishing of his fourth book, 
the periodic table, he turned full-time to writing. The periodic table is an autobiography loosely structured according to chemical elements, but it cemented his reputation. Saul Bellow declared it a necessary book. The Royal Institution of Britain considered it one of the best uh, scientific books ever published. What followed in the years, in the next decade, were many more essays, articles, interviews, and lectures. And his life was torn between his writing, his family, and defending himself from the controversy of his own views. It's still a subject of debate whether his death in 1987 was the result of an accident or a suicide. But why did Levy choose the periodic table? It's the title and it gives the form to this seminal work. I'd like to introduce Dr. David Pantaloni, the curator of physical science and medicine at this museum, to tell us more about the import of the table. Thank you, Jack, and you'll have to excuse my enthusiasm. Primo Levi is certainly one of my favorite writers. Uh, the Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev first proposed the modern version of the periodic table in 1869. It was a table of all known chemical elements organized into vertical rows sharing similar properties. This allowed chemists and students to move from column to column studying the repeating patterns or periods of elements. I like to think, think it's something like the repeating octaves in a musical scale. The periodic table also famously allowed for the prediction of elements that had yet to be discovered. What always strikes me is that Mendeleev's accomplishment paralleled a tumultuous period in Russian history, and that nation's endless struggles to reconcile individual expression and social order. In the 1860s, Tsar Alexander II had just freed the serfs, setting the stage for massive upheaval. Mendeleev did the same in chemistry, with a table that balanced natural order and the unique character of each element, thus revolutionizing chemistry. Since that time, there have been over a thousand versions of the periodic table. The varieties speak to continuously evolving views, needs, and approaches of chemists. Following this evening's talk, I invite the audience up to view these two unique uh, Canadian versions of the periodic table. Um, both of them, as you see, are in three dimensions. Montreal chemist and educator Fernando Dufour's transparent, evergreen-like model, the elementary, is a highly popular three-dimensional version that highlights symmetries not obvious in the tabular form. The inventive and prolific Canadian chemist Don Stedman created the Art Deco-like model before us from the 1940s. He believed, or better fantasized, in a periodic table of up to 5,000 elements. An expert on this, uh, his, uh, on the Stedman model, Chris Miedema is in the audience and he'll be here afterwards to talk to people. And a special guest tonight, uh, Paul Dufour, Fernando Dufour's son, is here to speak to the elementary. But overall tonight, we are here to celebrate the most beautiful expression of the periodic table as literature. Primo Levi, no stranger to tumultuous times, gave us the gift of another dimension of the periodic table, humanity. Thank you and enjoy your evening. Thank you, David. So the book, The Periodic Table, takes the form of 21 short chapters, each one devoted to an element, uh, from argon to carbon. They don't deal directly with the element, but rather use this as a structure for Levy's experience, for his life, for his thoughts. But let's hear Levy, in his own words, using brief ex extracts from his book. I'd like to bring up three notables who I'll introduce, uh, and they can come to the stage. Italy, Italy's ambassador to Canada, Andrea Meloni. He has selected the first passage and will read the original in Italian. Please. Andrea Meloni took up his post two years ago and has over 30 years of experience in the Foreign Service. He was formerly Italy's permanent representative to the Political and Security Committee of the European Union in Brussels. 
Uh, Andrea will be helping us, but I know that you have to leave early for another event. But please start, start the reading. Many, many thanks, and if you allow me, I would like briefly to, to thank you and the, uh, of course, the, the president of the museum, Denise Aymar, for, uh, for this invitation. And of course, it's always, um, one can, one can uh, ask in sense whether a, a, a diplomat or an ambassador has a place in a, in a science museum, a science event. And um, uh, when I was in, uh, you, you, you said something about it. My 30 years career, so 15 years ago, was uh, consul general in Buenos Aires, which is a, quite a, a, a substantive post in our in our system uh, for the Italians who live there. And and I once I went and uh, met the director of the largest museum in Buenos Aires, not a science museum, a museum of Beaux Arts, and he he was quite a character. But he when when I arrived, he was like, what what does it Consul do in a museum. I, 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 I think you were supposed simply to stamp passport. You know? So, so from from that time, I was very cautious when I entered the museum. But, but the, um, but in fact, the just just simply to say that the um, uh, science, science technology. In fact, uh, I devote almost uh, 30, 35 percent of my, my total time here in in, in Canada in trying to. Uh, well, uh, uh, foster the uh, scientific relation between the two countries. So, in, here in Canada, is very important. One one short word. Um, uh, you you mentioned that the sequestro um, nuovo. If this is a man, uh, he acquired well fame in Italy, notoriety in Italy, in the in the not immediately, but uh, some time after. Uh, Levy wrote it. Well, I I, I was a, a, a I was a teenager in the 60s, but I can assure you that uh, Primo Levi was a sort of uh, a reference. I wouldn't say a mandatory reading, but people do uh, did read the book, and it was uh, exceptionally important for our overall. And, uh, formation as uh, as youngs. So I I have chosen one. Um, a uh, few lines from the um, uh, what, what's the name? I think potash potash in, uh, in, potassium. in English potassium potash is another thing. Well, potassium, and um, because it's um, it's about the need to differentiate often and to be uh, to be able to uh, make a difference where it is not very obvious. You know, the Jesuit said. Uh, distinguished frequenter, and so they they knew what we, they were talking about. So this is uh, I, I I will read in Italian. Io pensavo a un'altra morale più terrena e concreta, e credo che ogni chimico militante la potrà confermare. Che occorre diffidare del quasi uguale. Il sodio è quasi uguale al potassio, ma col sodio non sarebbe successo nulla, del praticamente identico, del pressappoco, dell'oppure, di tutti i surrogati e di tutti i rappezzi. Le differenze possono essere piccole, ma portare a conseguenze radicalmente diverse come gli aghi degli scambi. Il mestiere del chimico consiste in buona parte nel guardarsi da queste differenze, nel conoscerle da vicino nel prevederne gli effetti, non solo il mestiere del chimico. Thanks. I will, I, will read, I will read the English, but thank you very much, Your Excellency. I found a different conclusion, he said, more down to earth, more concrete, one I believe that every dedicated chemist can confirm that we must be on guard against what I call the almost the same. Just as sodium is almost the same as potassium, but if I had used sodium in this experiment, nothing would have happened. So we must pay attention to the practically identical, the thereabouts, the either, the ors, the substitutes, the lookalikes. The differences could be very small, but they lead to radically different consequences. 
like the points on a railway switch. The chemist's craft consists in large part of being wary or aware of the differences, of knowing them well, of predict predicting their effects, and this is true not only for the chemist. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, next, I'm going to call on two gentlemen uh, who will read, in, not in tandem, but one after each other. Uh, so, Vincent Piazza and Joel Deanna, if you want to come up, I'll just introduce you. And Joel will start our reading. Joel was born in Turin. Only recently he mentioned to me that he too, surprisingly, thought of himself as a Holocaust survivor. And that was an interesting point. He was hidden during the war. After his immigration to Canada in 1954, he graduated in math. He fulfilled a master's in economics and then proceeded on to three PhDs. At which point, he began lecturing at the University of Ottawa and then had an illustrious career at Statistics Canada. Vincenzo Piazza was born in Cattolica Eraclia, Sicily, and emigrated to Canada in 1956. He was a teacher of religion, French, and grammar. But perhaps most importantly, he is my favorite armchair philosopher, and he helped choose the readers tonight. He's probably best recognized for being a baker, or rather, Ottawa's first bagel maker at the Ottawa Bagel and Deli. Uh, so, gentlemen, Joel, would you come first? Oh, I'm sorry, it's Vincent. Vincent, <laughs> Silver. From the chapter Silver, excuse me. Welcome, benvenuti. I was in search of events, mine and those of others, which I wanted to describe in a book to see if I could convey to the reader the strong and bitter flavor of our trade, which in fact is like any life's work, just a part of, a of the strenuous version of the business of living. Of living. It did not seem fair to me that the world should know everything about how the doctor, prostitute, sailor, assassin, countess, ancient Roman, conspirator, and Polynesian lives, and know nothing about how we, transformers of matter, live. In this book, I would deliberately, deliberately neglect the description of the chemistry of colossal plants and dizzying output because this is collective work and therefore anonymous. I was more interested in the stories of the solitary chemist, unarmed and on foot, at the measure of man, and which with few exceptions has been mine. But it has also been the chemistry of the founders, who did not work in teams but alone, surrounded by the indifference of their time, generally without profit, and who confronted matter without aids, with their brains and hands, with reason and imagination. Thank you. Sure. From the chapter Nickel. Good evening. Uh, we are chemists, that is, hunters. Ours are the two experiences of adult life of which Pavese spoke success and failure, to kill the white whale or wreck the ship. One should not surrender to incomprehensible matter. One must not just sit down. We are here for this, to make mistakes and to correct ourselves, to stand the blows and hand them out. We must never feel disarmed. Nature is immense and complex, but it is not impermeable to the intelligence we must circle around it, pierce and probe it, to look for the openings or make it. Ah, the so tender and delicate zinc, so yielding to acid which gulps it down in a single mouthful, 
behaves, however, in a very different fashion when it is very pure. Then it it obstinately resists the attack. One could draw from this two conflicting philosophical conclusions. The praise of purity, which protects from evil like a coat of mail, and the praise of impurity, which gives rise to changes, in other words, to life. I discarded the first. It was disgustingly moralistic, and I lingered over the second, which I found more congenial. In order for the wheel to turn, for life to be lived, impurities are needed, just as in the soil, if it is to be fertile. Dissension, diversity, mixed among the grains of salt and mustard, these are necessary for life. But fascism does not want them. It forbids them. It wants everybody to be the same. And we are not. But immaculate virtue does not exist either, or if it, is, if it exists, it is detestable. So take the solution of copper sulfate and add a drop of it to sulfuric acid and see the reaction begin. The, the zinc wakes up, it is covered with a white fur of hydrogen bubbles, the enchantment is taking place, you can leave it to its fate. Chromium. But I had returned from captivity three months before and was living badly. The things I'd seen and suffered were burning inside me. I felt closer to the dead than to the living and felt guilty at being a man because men had built Auschwitz and Auschwitz has gulped down millions of human beings and many of my friends and a woman who was dear to my heart. It seemed to me that I would be purified if I told its story, and I felt the ancient mariner who stops the wedding guests going to the feast and inflicts the story of his misfortune on them. I was writing concise and even bloody poems, telling my story at breakneck speed, either by talking to people or by writing down, so much so that gradually a book was later born. By writing, I found peace for a while and felt myself become a man again, a person like everyone else, neither a martyr nor a saint, one of those people who start a family and look to the future rather than the past. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Vincent. Great. That gives you a bit of a flavor, a taste of Primo Levi. Um, now let me introduce our keynote speaker. Dr. Victor Snikas was born in Kaunas, Lithuania, in 1937 and spent his childhood in Germany during World War II. He received a science degree at the University of Alberta a master's at the University of California, Berkeley, a doctorate at the University of Oregon, and returned to Canada for a postdoctoral year at the National Research Council. He then joined the faculty at the University of Waterloo in 1966 and held the Monsanto National Research Council Industrial Research Chair, when in 1998 he accepted the Bader Chair in Organic Chemistry at Queen's University. A substantial portion of his work has been related to boron and lithium, both of which he describes as elements of the 21st century. This year's Nobel Prize in chemistry went to three scientists who discovered catalytic organic reactions. One was an organoboron chemist who inspired his work. The other is Nobel Prize winner Richard Heck, who accepted Dr. Snikas' invention and invitation in 2006 to come to Queens to conduct research. Victor. Thank you very much. 
I just saw my life go before me and past me as I listened to the elements and the nice words of Primo Levi as expressed both in English and in Italian. All those elements are significant to me from my youth. They resonated very, very strongly as I listened to wonderful words. Boron is an element of great importance to us, as Jack indicated. Boron came to my life earlier than Jack indicated. It came to me as an undergraduate student. When I lived in an apartment for $25 a month, which, when you turned off the lights, had a number of cockroaches running around. And we learned by going to the pharmacy and picking up boric acid in a little container for a very, very cheap price, that if we spread that around the boards, floorboards, in the morning you would find the cockroaches belly up. They're gone. We didn't use them for breakfast that morning either. So boric acid began long ago in my life. It continues because of its research qualities for our programs. I am here as someone that represents this gentleman, Alfred Bader, who gave me this honor to present to you my views as a chemist and my relationship, if I can, with respect to this great author, chemist, Primo Levi. Alfred is a Queens graduate. There he is in an army uniform, 1945. Alfred started a chemical company in his garage. And he started it with one, making one chemical. Alfred is a donor of great pieces of art to Queen's University, among them now two Rembrandts. And this continues. Another one. You can see them at the Etherington Gallery in Kingston, Queen's University. And Alfred is a very, very widely based person in terms of appreciation of the connections of art and chemistry at one extreme and the other, but jointly in various ways, which I hope you'll appreciate as I go on. So Alfred tells a story of him writing a letter to Eastman Kodak Chemical Company and saying, I would like to order this chemical from you. Please send it to me as rapidly as possible. It's very important to our research program. He waited. He waited. He waited. After a while, he got really anxious, so he wrote a letter to Eastman Kodak saying, please send me this chemical. I need it. He received an answer saying, we have many orders. We will get to your order eventually. Don't bother us. So Alfred had a saying, which then became famous in his catalogs. He stood there with arms wide open, glasses in hand, and he said, please bother us. <laughs> and that is sort of the legacy that he left us as chemists and also entrepreneurs. When I received this invitation, I picked up my book, Primo Levi. I turned the page, opened it, and I saw Un cadeau de Stefano Superchi, my Italian former postdoctoral fellow. In 1998, when I came to Queen's University as the Bader Chair, he gave me this book, and that was my initial knowledge of his writing, in particular, this volume. And I turned the page again, and I found something I do regularly and something that my wife really dislikes of me, <laughs> scribbling in books. Boric acid is there, vigro columns, distillation apparatus, phosphorus. You go down the line in terms of elements, and then you see something like, trustworthiness, 
equals virtue, strong virtue. That's an element that he taught in his book and that we try to teach overall in science. What is chemistry? Democritus said in the fifth century, we have small particles called atoms, infinite in number, eternal, absolutely simple, different shape, order, and position. Combinations of which are infinite. Continued aggregation and disaggregation of atoms. Wonderful at the time that he said it. <laughs> so, the definition of chemistry, as stated by Democritus, is already quite advanced at the time that he said it, and still continues. Jefferson, in a letter to his grandson, 1908, 1809, if you are obligated to neglect anything, let it be your chemistry. <laughs> it is the least useful and the least amusing to a country gentleman. But for chemistry, you must shut yourself up in your laboratory and neglect care of your affairs and your health, which calls you out of doors. Chemistry is of value to the amateur inhabiting a city. He has no room there for outdoor amusements. 1809. What's your view of chemistry? We can discuss that. So, the last one in the series is conclusions from essays of 35,000 high school students in the USA, 27, eight years ago, collected by Margaret Mead, anthropologist, someone well known, and stated in there is his or her, that means his or her means you can have female chemists, of course is uninteresting, dull, monotonous, time-consuming. He does not know what is going on in the world. He neglects his family, nor their intellectual interests, social life, or hobbies. He bores everyone. <laughs> Increasing talk to no one that can understand him. No one wants to be such a scientist or to marry him. <laughs> so that's at the stage. Chemistry defined for Primo Levi, more seriously, the more I think Brilliantly, for me, chemistry represented an indefinite, indefinite cloud of future potentialities that enveloped my life to come in black volumes, torn by fiery flashes like those that had hit in Mount Sinai. Like Moses, from that cloud, I expected my law, the principle of order in me, around me, and in the world. So, Chemistry is about a number of things that you and I see every day. And my interest in chemistry began this way, as I think it began with Primo Levi. Look at matter, look at what surrounds you, and see whether you can connect it anyway to principles of where things come from. So, we learn, and it's easy if you have a grounding in chemistry at a very, very primitive level, initial level. What is this molecule? It is an antioxidant. If you understand oxidation reduction, another pre very simple principle, then you'll know this protects your bread from going stale, deteriorating rapidly. If you know this plant, this plant is, now without glasses I can't see, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> But it is a source of ephedrine. Ephedrine is bronchodilator. You have it in cough syrups. It clears out things and makes you happier overnight. <laughs> Cocaine is a substance that we all recognize for abuse qualities. But did you know that cocaine has a deadness or we have indebtedness to cocaine because through it, Novocaine and various other painkillers came out that you receive when you're at the dentist. Make your life easy. These substances, actually substance, Advil and ibuprofen are the same, are synthetic molecules that we really pride ourselves as organic chemists that we can make in very large quantities. 
for distribution for various aspects of anti-inflammatory treatment. If you read closely, you'll find adverse side effects. If you read them too closely, you will never take an Advil. <laughs> but we know that we have to take these things with some degree of flexibility. If you go into the forests of British Columbia and Washington, you'll find a yew tree. And you'll find it rich in a compound that is called polytaxol. It's originally, but polytaxol, when it became commercial, cancer, breast cancer in particular, is treated by this drug most favorably. It's a complex molecule architecturally, tremendously complex. And we still don't have a way to make it in an economic way as synthetic chemists, which shows you the state of the art of our field. You look at the cost, and in, ca in fact, increasing low, qu low quantity of this is available from yew trees, and there's a problem associated with that. You smell a lime or an orange, it's due to a chemical, it's limonene. It comes from the extracts of these two fruits. And it can, it can tell you exactly, if you have it pure, that that's what it comes from, because the odor is associated with it. If you have caraway seeds or chiclets, they're very different in terms of olfaction qualities. They are also very different chemically in one particular property. That property has to do with a term we use and call chirality. And it's just handedness. It's mirror images. It was referred to by Jack already. We're reflecting. Mirror effect. You can't overlap your two hands. They're different in that property only. So, I invite you to test this quality by these molecular models, which are mirror images of the other, one of the other, and just see whether or not I'm saying anything sensible. <laughs> and at the same time, let me throw out to you a molecule that is very easy to identify, and you can, you can name this molecule without any, any degree of difficulty. So you know propane and you know butane, so what is the name of the shape? Cubane. Cubane. There you go. By the way, I want those back. <laughs> so we go into this property of chirality. Chirality is an artistic element, of course, in the hands, and chirality is artistic in this representation. And here, the molecules I threw out to you, you will see the chiral or the mirror image relationship in the same way that you see in hands, in the same way that you see in shoes, and so on. And in the same way that you see of the scientist, there is one, there is another mirror image relationship. Test it out tomorrow. What do you think of scientists? Where do you think they work? Well, this is a, this is a laboratory that doesn't exist. This is too clean. This is pure. This is scientists doing nothing. <laughs> They're not working. They're standing around. They're models, un undoubtedly. This is a laboratory. <laughs> the other extreme. But it used to be in olden days. Laboratories would be of the type that were dungeons. We loved the science so much, we didn't care. Today, you need to be not only a chemist, but you need to be an engineer. You need to have both elements going for you at the same time in order to appreciate what happens, let's say, in a synthesis of ibuprofen, Advil, any molecule. You need to relate to not only the chemistry, but the ability to transform various aspects of the chemistry into large quantities controlled in a controlled manner representation of large-scale synthesis in a plant, you can see the kind of entities that are involved. 
Okay, so what happened in terms of chemical development today? Today, appreciation of chemistry is quite poor, in my opinion, and science in general. So, how many people view chemistry this way in this audience? Thank you very much, several. How many people view scientists this way in the audience? Thank you. There are other kinds of scientists. I represent one, and I hope to convince you that actually we're reasonable people overall. My history briefly, already mentioned, Kaunas, Second World War, underground in Berlin. I remember elements that were associated with Primo Levi's book, but I was outside, I was lucky. Through into Bavaria, Bayern, out Bremen, into Canada for Halifax, across all the way, my mother said, my God, what have we done? <laughs> when she saw the prairies. <laughs> Ended up in foremost Alberta, and then established study and eventual interests in chemistry. So I'd like to take you through a tour of <clears throat> the people that affected my life, and I think relationship of that type is general. We chemists and we scientists in general have these kinds of elements associated with our lives. And one of them already was mentioned by Jack, explosions. This is a nice art piece taken from Alfred Bader collection. So I remember being in high school, Mr. McLeod taught me chemistry. Mr. McLeod was a good teacher and a good person, but he had zero control of the class. He would turn around and write a formula on the blackboard and someone would throw a paper airplane. But at the end, in the last day, he demonstrated an experiment. He demonstrated an experiment by taking a test tube and adding something to a test tube and then saying what it was. And he said, this is ammoniacal silver ion. And it was beautifully blue beautifully blue. So I saw something like this actually was darker than this. It was sort of even darker than that. Forget about this. And I thought, I want to do that. I want to go into this area because that's fascinating. I want to understand. You look at that color, you see it everywhere in modern terms. You see it in vases. You see it in various things that we use, take for granted, plastic cases. You see it in beautiful dresses. You see it in tarantulas, which you don't want to get too close to, but the color is of that. So imagine my horror when I found out about half a century later that it wasn't ammoniacal silver. That was, in fact, that it was ammoniacal silver, but in fact, the color of ammoniacal silver is colorless. And therefore, what I do remember was not demonstrated at all. And for 50 years, I was under the wrong impression why I went into chemistry. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's the color change that mattered. It turns out it was cobalt that was demonstrated, and further chemistry can proceed from there. So I bought a book because Mr. McLeod couldn't really control the class. I couldn't pay attention. And I studied chemistry on my own and eventually went further. Then Rube Sandine at the University of Alberta hit me between the eyes with organic chemistry. Imagine this gentleman coming into a lecture wearing white bucks. Well, you don't relate, the younger ones won't relate to white bucks. White bucks, a button-down shirt, black tie, a checkered jacket. He was a gambler. He wasn't a chemistry professor. 
He'd come up, he'd take a test tube like Mr. McLeod, and he'd add a few drops, and he'd shake it. Something happened, the color changed, something occurred. He wrote it on a blackboard in letters that were about 20 centimeters tall. And that stuck forever, the association of the reaction and the explanation. And that continued the interest in becoming a chemist. So he told a story one time about Jurassic and Rosencrantz. He said, there was this chemist called Carl Jurassi, and he had this lady chemist called Maria Rosenkranz. And they would go into the Mexican desert, and they disappeared for weeks, and they collected yams. And they published papers. They came back and published papers. It's in the Journal of American Chemical Society. Look it up. I didn't realize what he was doing to me then, or to us. He was simply gently pushing us into reading the current information coming out about steroids, molecules that we know very well. Carl Jurassi in a laboratory, Mexican plants being picked by Russell Marker, another really well important name in organic chemistry. And out of that came contraceptive agents, which everyone knows well. And out of that came also Jurassic self-maintained contraceptive eyeglasses. <laughs> <laughs> and then I found out that actually Maria Rosencrantz wasn't Maria Rosencrantz. It was Mark Rose, George Rosencrantz who was out there with him. But the story was much more interesting the way he told it. <laughs> if you're interested in Carl Jurassic recently, this is probably his best book to read. It's intrigue. It's science in the most intricate form. It's good. Do you know the word Schadenfreunde? People's memory is unbelievably long because of our mutual dependence on our need for absolute trust. Once someone's credibility in science is damaged, it can never be totally repaired. Most often it's gone for good. There's a dictum that I relate to very strongly. You have to be honest, you have to publish factual information, you can make mistakes. If you make mistakes, tell them, tell the audience, tell the, the chemical literature that it's a mistake. Then, in the University of Oregon, again, as Jack mentioned, my history, I met this man, Virgil Beckelheide, he said, work hard, dedicate yourself, think hard. Don't let the first idea that comes to your mind be the idea that you test experimentally. Think harder, work beyond that, and see what you come, come up with. He told me, he told us, you will never get at the truth if you always have to watch what you say. He taught me about teaching, relating. There's something about teaching, not just advanced courses, to take people who don't have that much background and get them excited about the subject is very satisfying. Another question that can be asked and answered. I came to NRC, I ran down the hallway, but I was not as fast as this gentleman, Ted Edwards, Ted Edwards used to run from one end of the hallway to the next to answer the single telephone that was on that floor. <laughs> you look at his eyes, they glistened. And he had this twitch of the eyebrows. And by that, I related to him, and we related to him. And Dr. Ab Simon, who's in the audience, related to him. That's exciting, we said. We want to follow these ideas that he put forward to us. Let's see what happens. Let's ask the what-if questions. Finally, I met Richard Mansky. I never called him Richard Mansky or Richard. It's always Dr. Mansky. I, that's a fear that was present to me from undergraduate days. It took me years to call my PhD professor Virgil. <laughs> Richard Mansky 
very important chemist, Canadian chemist, international chemist, some history here, was a Queen's graduate. I have his thesis. What a wonderful gift I received. Here are some of the hieroglyphics of organic chemistry in the lab book. You look carefully at the English, it's perfect. And it's detailed, and it's revealing. And he had little bottles that he stored his chemicals in. You look at those bottles today, you open them up, they're still pure molecules, nothing's happened to them 20, 30 years afterwards. And he made them pure. Richard Mansky had many characteristics that one could admire. And again, I relate in general, I relate to you, hopefully, in a sense that you have people you admire and follow as heroes and mentors. He grew orchids. He had an orchid named after him, Manskensis. He made statements that were meaningful in terms of the effect of science. Take that one second. I conclude by pointing out that technology and comfort add nothing to our character and may increase our problems. While weakening our ability to confront them, what is needed is the larger conception of our sociological responsibility and one that comprehends our inescapable involvement in a common destiny of homo sapiens. You can put that into modern context. This one comes at the beginning. It's easy to appreciate. My mother discovered that tincture of laudanum, which was a plant that he worked on in terms of isolation of new organic molecules from, relieved my insomnia. I slept long and peacefully and became a model child. <laughs> What's in laudanum? Of course, it's morphine alkaloids. <laughs> His association from an alkaloid early age. Mansky, I met in 1977, when I was appointed, no, 77, he passed away, 67, when I was appointed at Waterloo. And I used to see him in the laboratory still, this is taken much earlier, and of course, no gloves today, that's a no-no, safety officer will be after you immediately. No glasses, another no-no, and guess what, a pipe. So, chemistry is dangerous, but he made it a little more challenging. And I saw him doing this many times, even at old age. There's an element we can discuss further from that, which I'll leave to you. That's, he made great martinis, he played the violin, he wrote a cookbook near the end of his life by Marcent H. Krish, so Please write that out and do an anagram because that's his name. And in that book are many recipes which you'd like to take up because they're really good recipes and they also relate to his lady friends he knew in his life, mostly blondes. And here's one, Corbin de Guerre. I often go back to Paris. I attempt to but when I do, I attempt to judge for myself without whether or not the oft-reported praise of French cooking is, in fact, deserved. Vanda is his cousin twice removed. <laughs> he goes on and discusses this. Then, at the end, he says, My recollection of the pheasant, rarely as I have had it, however, left me confused until Vanda explained that uh, Fatun Darlan was crow. I did not know until that time that I would ever eat a crow, although I once saw a falcon do just that. <laughs> Tells you the kind of person he was. Finally, and finally, Richard Heck, Nagishi Nagishi, Akira Suzuki, the Nobelist of 2010 in chemistry, I learned from Richard Heck, when he was in our laboratory, aspects of scientific humility, ability to appreciate, even at the age where he was in our laboratories, late 70s, appreciate uh, new discovery, 
discovery in organic chemistry, and be very, very giving in terms of what others have contributed to the field. Right here, we go back to cobalt, CO, the symbol for cobalt. And when he came, he said, I want to do more chemistry in cobalt from 1972. We're still contemplating, because he's no longer with us, whether or not we can attack this problem. So on the day he received the Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize committee press person called him. Said, so, Dr. Heck, is this exciting for you? With a big pause. He, I guess you would call it exciting, he would answer. He said, so, Dr. Heck, are you celebrating this event? The answer, again after hesitation, no, not really. What are you doing, Dr. Heck? Well, we're sitting around my wife and here and a couple of friends. I see. Was this a was this surprising event, Dr. Heck? Yes, it was a surprising event. Dead silence. That was the end of the interview. <laughs> it says a lot about Richard Heck and about many scientists. Briefly, my mother and father gave me the incentive to always look for unexpected, to be curious, to dedicate oneself to tasks. First few lines recently called Rainmaking. Drive along the squinting stone stacked wall out of country and back into town at night, past hedgerows and tree-lined farm roads, and observe, moving in, the season cleaned by the downpours of a cloud mass, undone as it hitches up to the crest down into the valley. Waves. Since he got married and has two children, his language has changed drastically. He used to write about Greek gods, which I never could comprehend. Now I understand him. And that's the creation from him and his wife. And that's how they treat me. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge fully the caring, the nurturing, the constant joy for life given to our family, children, my wife. He said, she said, don't show any others. <laughs> I'm going to end my discussion with my, hopefully with a relationship to Primo Levi, in terms of three quotations. Some, two of them have already been made. We want to convey to the layman the strong and bitter flavor of our trade. It does not seem fair to me that the world should be known should know everything about the doctor, prostitute, sailor, assassin, countess, ancient Roman, conspirator, Polynesian, lives, and nothing about how we transformers of matter live. So I relate to this in the following way. I'm sitting on the plane. Besides me sits a gentleman, and he says, what are you doing when I'm scribbling organic formula on a piece of paper? I say, I'm drawing organic formula. Organic? I said, yes. You're a chemist? Yes. There's two answers to that usually come forward. Number one, I hated organic chemistry. <laughs> and I can usually tell why in one, one simple phrase. We'll leave that. The other one is, you're one of those people that pollutes the world. So, I say to him, well, we play with molecules. We try to construct molecules that are useful for society. And molecules are constructed like Lego blocks. I tried to explain that feature. And if you're really clever, you can construct a double helix by using Lego blocks. Doesn't phase him at all. And so I say, do you have children? Yes. Have they ever had ear infections? Oh, yes. What do you think solved that? Oh, some medicine. Some medicine? Some medicine such as penicillin or ampicillin 
made it possible for you not to have, not for your child, not to have an ear defect for the rest of his life. Oh, oh. Then he turned around and started reading the normal magazine, airline magazine. Second quote, we are here, we are chemists, we are hunters. We make mistakes, we correct ourselves. We have to stand the blows and hand them out. The recent discovery, not in chemistry but in physics, sort of illustrates how we proceed. This is graphene. You probably have seen such designs in chandeliers, in buildings. Worse graphene, graphene is a lead pencil. Pencils aren't lead. They're graphite. That's graphite carbon. And Primo Levy relates to that as a chapter at the end. And what happened in physics to these two Russian scientists at Manchester University? They said one Friday afternoon, we're not going to do the chemistry we're getting grant for. Let's just play. Let's do something different. Let's take graphite, and let's make it really as thin as possible. How do you do that? Let's put it on a surface of some kind, and then try to thin it, thin it down to, so it's really, really tiny micrometer type thinness. So they did that with a piece of scotch tape. And out of that came a layer that I relate to very strongly in terms of the science we do, the chemistry we do. And at rate, I rate too very strongly and when I walk down a sidewalk, looking down, I see hexagons all over the place. I start getting new ideas for chemistry. Then I hit a telephone post. <laughs> That's okay, that clears the mind. <laughs> and the two gentlemen that are responsible for this discovery, simple, now outstandingly important, in materials are these two, game and Novozolev, Novozolov, and from graphite into layer monolayers. And out of that, nanotechnology is a thriving field. Functional systems, molecular scale, manipulation of matter on an atomic molecular level, and you are benefiting, we are benefiting from this today. Finally, relate to this strongly as well. What chemists fa facing the periodic table does not perceive scattered among them the sad tatters or trophies of his own professional past? On one of these pages, there are things that say in a formula, afterwards we'll do something. There are some successes, there's lots of error, there's guilt, there's victory, there's defeat. One of the most important statements made in the last century to me, and to organic chemistry in general, was by French chemist Biot. This is a beautiful response to what we have for chemistry, for science in general. And he said, Vous avez aimé bien, dit Biot, que vos cristaux, vos cristaux placés à votre droite, devront à droite le plein de polarisation, et que vous, vos cristaux placés à votre gauche, de Viron gauche. Chirality. Left-handed, right-handedness. It has to do with a property called polarized light. Takes you in one direction, takes you the opposite direction, left and right hands. When Pasteur, who was a student, said, we, Bio took over, Jim charged the rest. He wanted to reproduce the experiment. He did it, and here, Mon cher enfant, j'ai tant aimé les sciences dans ma vie que cela me fait battre le cœur. My heart beats strongly when I have dedicated so much of my life to science, progress of it. So, finally, Mendeleev's periodic table is poetry. Levy says it even rhymes. That I have yet to experience. 
But on the other hand, these kinds of elements are part of us in terms of relationship to art <laughs> and to teaching. <laughs> so when you teach students today, you have to be really a different kind of person. You cannot just simply teach them science. You have to perform. And you have to make sure that you don't deal with one particular subject too deeply and without so consistency because they will begin to jiggle. They cannot maintain a position in one place. So we teach about who are I teach who are responsible for chemistry and many other professors do if they want to relate the person to chemistry there's always a good relationship to establish because there are other elements so you heard at the beginning of this this wonderful organized sequence on Primo Levi a, a tune how many of you recognize that tune one, two, three, four, five. How many of you know about kismet? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so I relate to this tune because the composer of this tune, and there is the public score in Russian, Prince Igor was composed by Alexander Borodin. And when I teach organic chemistry, and I talk about the aldol reaction, very famous, very important, I say, this reaction was discovered by this musician who lived in the same time period as Rimsky-Korsakov, Tchaikovsky, and others. And he did this as a job. And on the side, he composed music. And I found out recently, he had this to say. As a composer seeking to remain anonymous, I am shy of confessing my musical activity. For others, it is their chief business, the occupation and aim of life. For me, it is a relaxation, a pastime which distracts me from my principal business, my professorship. I love my profession and my science. I love the academy, my pupils. Because to direct the work of young people, one must be close to them. Music is a relaxation for more serious occupations. And finally, respectable people do not write music or make love as a career. <laughs> Some time ago, he said this. So when I teach the Aldo reaction, I say Borodin. And I say, listen to Prince Igor as well. And the connection between art, music, and chemistry become, to me, very obvious. Lithium is now, as Jack mentioned, the other element associated with our lives. Lithium is at the top of this periodic table. Well, hydrogen is, but then lithium is next. Lithium is a nice soft metal that you can handle, not like potassium. Sodium is actually not bad. You can handle it in the air. Lithium is associated with spodumene, which is a mineral of lithium aluminum. Silicon involved, lithium can be a gem. Kunzite with an E, but Kunz was the discoverer or the jeweler that made this. And lithium you can find in various things aside from batteries, which are an important event today, in various aspects of your life. Here are some. Did you know that about 200 to 600 micrograms of lithium is your dietary intake. It's in your body. Did you know that there are several bands who make a lot of noise, at least for those over, for those over 40, are named lithium ensembles and so on? And so I relate to this because we have now a design for my business card, which is called lithium instead of platinum, designed by a student. It's also a t-shirt. We'll get sued. And 
Here is a 1992 poem by Amy Laird, Collegial Lisgar at Ottawa, about lithium. I'm an anode for batteries of high voltage kinds, and my carbonate helps to cheer up depressed minds. I do so much work, and I'm never at rest, and of all the other elements, I'm clearly the best. <laughs> One poem. And finally, nickel, as this already described Primo Levi's interest, major impact of nickel in my life as an undergraduate at the University of Alberta. I made a nickel compound that 40 years later became very important in our research. Same molecule. How could that happen so easily? Marvelous event in our lives. And here's a nickel poem. Now, same, same uh, journal, but now written by an American girl. And nickel is a coin, you say, the five cent pieces of the USA, which is our pockets and wallets hides with the image of Jefferson on one side. Nickel is mine in many a nation, but it to Canada I would give my recommendation. For Ontario houses the largest ore, believed to have been caused by a meteor. <laughs> to purchase nickel just for fun, you need $5,880 per metric ton. <laughs> that's, that's how students are stimulated. If you have good teachers in high school, this happens very easily. Make sure that you hit them at the right time early. And there's a periodic table here, and there's one already mentioned by David. Here's a periodic table for sneakers. Not sneakers, sneakers. <laughs> so this is supposed to stimulate understanding sneaker curriculum, whatever that means. But these are sold by Locker, Foot Locker House. You can buy them online if you'd like, and they have all the basketball players' names associated with them, all the famous ones. So imagine if a high school student, or maybe earlier, sees this and begins to think about this and says, well, what is the periodic table? Pretty soon he wants to know what a periodic table really is. So I conclude by a couple of slides, PowerPoints. This is the chemist's prayer that we make all the time when we enter the laboratory because some things always go wrong. And you have to always make some kind of initial prayer to say that things will go right in the future. Make sure that you don't think too highly of yourself. Santana says, success is one beautiful cake. You cut it, you eat it, and you choke on it. I relate to that in chemists that I meet sometimes. This year's Nobel Prize winner in literature, Tranströmer, said, be proud. Inside your vaults, behind vaults, open endlessly. You will never be finished. And that's what it should be. Pass it on. Make discovery happen by others in the future. And Grignard, a famous organic chemist, who won a Nobel Prize in 1905, said, chacun de nous a son étoile. Suivons-la en vous félicitant de la voir chaque jour un peu plus loin. Follow your star. See it always higher and further in the future and succeed. Grignard lecturing in Université de Lyon. Things hit me here when I saw this first. Number one, he's doing experiments. That's the stimulus I received first and many of my generation received today, you're not allowed to demonstrate in class. I do, then I'm before safety committees <laughs> and infinite. Number two, students are well dressed, respectfully. Number three, those of you who know a little bit of carbon, know that carbon has four valences, four bonds to carbon. You look closely at carbon here, it has five. Those that teach you makes mistakes. Be critical. <laughs> Don't accept everything. My very favorite Czech poet, Ivan Klima, said this in a book. What do you believe in? That you must not live without purpose? That you must look to the consequences of your actions? Live in a way that brings no harm to anyone? You must leave some trace of yourself behind. And 
Finally, some, a word on students. I go into the lab a lot and say, how's that reaction going? And eventually I saw this note on a student's desk, and I took it. It said, nothing is impossible for the man who doesn't have to do it. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's true. So, I hope that the flavor of a scientist has been transmitted to you in some way from what I've said. I hope there's a relationship that I established enough with Primo Levi, who, when I read that book and now I saw these quotations again, changed my, my mind about writing and about literature. And now, uh, finished, I'm finished. Thank you, Jack. And I'm going to go back to the lab where I really belong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Stiglitz. Before you leave us, I'm going to ask you to sit down so I can ask just a couple of very personal questions. And then we'll ask for your questions. Personal. Ah, yes. You're not done yet. You're not yet. OK. You spoke about your present research on lithium. What do you hope to achieve? What will it mean when you get there? So, so these questions one has to reflect upon deeply and answer in some written manner. But uh, what, do you ref what do you hope to achieve? Uh, my, I think most people that teach achievement is in the future generation. It's to stimulate, to excite, and it doesn't have to be chemistry, it can be in any field. As long as you have the element of the excitement that shows this is something you can do, this is a direction you can take, and do probably something better than you have. If, uh, if you had to, what's, what's a typical day for you? you? I know you have a family, you do research, you travel and lecture and uh, give papers. I mean, there's a lot in what, your life. What, what's a typical day for you? Ah, uh, it's never typical. It's always atypical. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> well, uh, the, the audience should react to this, I think, in various ways. Well, I, yeah. We would learn much more. I, can, I hope that I already have said what's a typical day. Uh, dedication and involvement in science, mm -hmm. in chemistry, very long hours, and, uh, and always enjoyment and never feeling tired from this. Maybe that's our cue to have uh, questions. And if there are questions, I can pass the microphone around and Dr. Spiegel can answer them. Here, hold on. Thank you. Doctor, what is the uh, significance? Please, please, no doctors here. Okay. <laughs> Just my, my students say, hey, you. But you could try Vic Victor, please. What is, what is the origin of the word periodic? in the periodic table. I mean the etymology of it. David, you can answer that one. Better than I. <laughs> the, the organization of the table itself and the, the association of atomic, atomic weights and the periodic, periodicity of the elements so that one follows in a vertical way another and properties are associated with that and increasingly different properties and one follows it in a horizontal manner in the same way so you can predict properties associated with the next element given one before well, that's too simplistic but that's along that line It's not 50. This is Professor Rob Simon, who worked with Dr. Edwards, whom I mentioned, same time as I did. And I saw you make all those mistakes. You <laughs> <laughs> is that your question? No. I, I get really annoyed at you do when people talk, talk about chemicals as being nasties. Right? Want to make any comments on that? Do you get well, pissed off too? <laughs> pissed off, good word. So, well, the the element of chemicals, one has, one has to begin to explain 
if there's no basic understanding of atoms and molecules and bonds and things, it's very difficult to say one chemical is better than another, one's a pollutant, one is beneficial, but you know what they are. Try the following experiment with someone that you meet. Just ask the question, if I had this beautiful red molecule called carotene, which is in carrots, obviously, and which is present in other vegetables, and if I said to you, this molecule has the following properties, and you draw out the chemical structure formula, and underneath you say the molecular weight of this molecule is such and such, the spectroscopic properties are such and such. The melting point is such and such. You draw the same molecule on the right hand side, name the same associations, and under one you put extracted from carrots. And on the other one say made by Hoffman La Roche company. And you ask the question, even of students that take organic chemistry, which one of these will be the one you will eat. All the hands in favor of that one that comes from carrots. And the molecule is the same. It's the same. It's a pure substance. And it can be here, can be there, but it's still carotene and it's good for you. How do you ever overcome the problem of explaining that you're doing good things? Because there are many damaging things that have happened. No question. But the elements of positive things always come forward increasingly and optimism in humanity should play a strong role. Thank you. Sometimes in a scientific field there's a certain problem that becomes a bit of a, a holy grail problem, if you will. In mathematics it was a proof of certain theorems. In, uh, the in Poincaré theorem. Exactly. In molecular biology, for a while, it was, it was sequencing the human genome. Is there, is there uh, in organic chemistry, such a problem right now that has your, your focus? That's a tremendous question. So Poincaré, this was a Russian mathematician who, at the age of 30 or younger, cracked this theorem, which had been bothering mathematicians. So you're a mathematician, are you? So cracked it and made it public on the internet, the solution to this problem. There was a million dollar reward for this. He said, no thank you. I'm switching fields. I'm going to do something more interesting. <laughs> I relate to that. I relate to that. That's my aim is to make better things for better living, if you wish to use a phrase of the past but an attempt to contribute in medical ways. So what is the current organic problem that is burning, that is, that is, that may be the next Nobel Prize? I don't know. I can't point to it, which probably is a deficiency in me in terms of, in terms of ability to make that jump. Some people do that rapidly and well some people moderately and some people don't <laughs> so i can't i can't define it for you i'm sorry to say thank you thank you that's great victor thank you very much victor Again, our appreciation, Dr. Sikas, or Victor, as we can now call you, uh, and also to uh, Ambassador Maloney, uh, to David and Joel and Vince, uh, who were so good at, at introducing and reading, as well as to Claude, and for those behind the scenes as well, to Marilyn Reed, Emily Tector, Bruce Sutherland and Jocelyn Sutherland, Christine Abraham and Randy Richard in the back, uh, and, of course, to Yves saint -Ange. thank you all very much. Uh, and tonight, I'd like to give our final introduction to a wonderful and explosive talent uh, who is refined and is her own very special chemical reaction. 
and totally unique in the periodic table. I am sure there is something there. Madame Denise Amiot, the President and CEO of the Canadian Science and Technology Museums Corporation, to close the evening. very much, Jack. Uh, I've been called many things, but never that one. <laughs> uh, bonsoir tout le monde. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, thank you very much for attending uh, this uh, science talk. As you know, we do those on a monthly basis. If you're not on our mailing list, uh, make sure that we, uh, we have your uh, email so that we can send you those invitations. Uh, this talk uh, today, of course, is very special because it's also celebrating the International Year of Chemistry. And I'm sure that, uh, like me, you will never hear about chemistry the same way, thanks to your talk, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Snickers. Vic, okay, Vic, okay, Vic pour les intimes. Uh, this was very special. Thank you uh, to you uh, for being our MC. I think uh, we brought some humanity also to science, which is often not seen uh, by the public, and I think that's very, very important. And um, the, I'd like to recognize a number of partners that make this uh, possible. Uh, first, from the University of King's College in Halifax, the Situating Science Strategic Knowledge Cluster. We need to find an abbreviation for that. And the Contemporary Studies Program for funding this webcast. As you know, it's a first uh, for the uh, corporation, and we are very, very happy about that. And thank you for the good folks at the Ottawa Little Theatre, who kindly uh, lend us, in fact, the perfect uh, setting of furniture for our presenters, <laughs> and uh, for donating three pairs of uh, passes. Uh, for their current productions called I Hate Hamlet. And it's interesting because um, it's not the name of a scientist. <laughs> when uh, you arrived tonight, you were each uh, given a ticket, so it's now time to do the drawing. As I said, there will be three of them. So, number 217339. Do we have a winner? Yes, good. <laughs> you think you have the good one? I can repeat 217339. It's confirmed. It's confirmed. 217320. Aha, good, excellent. And we have the last one, 217317. Bingo! <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> so, um, because we talked about chemistry tonight, I want to take this opportunity as well as the CEO of our corporations to tell you about two exhibitions we have. Uh, right now, one that you can uh, see. Uh, it's one on the science of glass. We will do the official opening, uh, in fact, uh, December 1st, so you're all invited if you're interested. It's at 4.30. And also on December 7th, we have a second exhibit, and this one will be, it's a small one, it's linked to our car exhibition, and it's about the use of bioplastics in automobiles. So uh, it will be, uh, you'll be able to see this on December 7th. So on this again, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Vic. And thank you, Jack. Uh, pleasure to see you all um, enjoying this great talk. Merci beaucoup.